Hey, chill. You're gonna break it. <laughs> ah, the worst cars only dumb people buy. We have fire traps, Italian stallions, and even cars you probably didn't even know existed. Because <laughs> they shouldn't. Today on Idealist, we are covering the least ideal cars ever made. Buckle up and let's go. Okay, do you know what the Mazda CX-7 and Mazda Speed 3 have in common? The same engine. Yes, and it's unfortunate because the turbocharged 2.3 liter MZR L3 VDT inline four's high pressure fuel pump can barely supply enough fuel when you put the pedal to the metal. But with any modification, it can cause the engine to run lean, which will cause it to detonate and left unchecked seize. Luckily, the fix is easy. You just install an upgraded high pressure fuel pump. Unfortunately, if you're looking to buy one, the only way to tell if it's been upgraded is to actually disassemble the pump and look. But this next one trick pony needs no disassembly to know exactly what it is. Real quick, thank you Bespoke Post for sponsoring today's video. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club that delivers awesome boxes of high quality goods from under the radar brands to your front door. Plus, it's free to join. Each Bespoke Post box has around $70 in retail value, but only costs a fraction of that. Every month, based on your preference quiz, Bespoke Post introduces members to a different box lineup containing products such as outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more. The best part about Bespoke Post is that you only pay for what you want. Before shipping, you get a sneak peek into the box that was chosen for you, and you can decide if you wanna keep it, swap it for something different, or skip the month entirely for no charge. When you purchase Bespoke Post, you are supporting local businesses. 90% of the sold products come from small brands many of which are based right here in the US. We received the Roast, which Dino the intern loved because it's a portable way to get your morning caffeine kick. Then we received the Cocoon. It's this camp blanket that transforms into a pillow and a sleeping bag. And we got the Hawker. This meal was incredible and I'm gonna be using this knife for a long time. Treat yourself to a Bespoke Post box or give your loved one a present they'll never forget. Go to bespokepost.com slash ideal20 or click the link in the description and enter code ideal20 at checkout to get 20% off your first Bespoke Post box. Thanks for supporting the sponsors that support us. Now let's roll back to the show. The Ford Mustang EcoBoost. Okay, yes, yeah, some of you will be triggered and we're just getting started, but to me, and probably most of you, Mustangs have always been this very simple recipe. They're affordable, they're compact, sporty styling, and with a good old American V8. It's like warm apple pie and vanilla ice cream. Mmm, so good and tasty. And that's where the Mustang EcoBoost is some sort of pistachio gelato? Sure, not everyone needs a vanilla V8, but that eight cylinder rumble is the epitome of American pony cars. A turbo four just sounds wrong. Ford screwed up once in the 80s with the Fox body Mustang SVO, which had a turbo four. They should have learned from their mistakes. Putting a four cylinder in a Mustang is like changing the recipe of Coca-Cola. And we all know how that went down. <laughs> which if you wanna go watch your bank account go down, this next rig can be your anchor. It's the Land Rover Freelander. This was the biggest swing and miss for Land Rover ever. It was unreliable, even for Land Rover standards, which are already lower than my IQ. It's not as luxurious or as rugged as its more expensive siblings. Plus, it had a myriad of engine issues, horrible fuel economy, faulty electronics, and the chances of the infotainment system just completely up and dying were pretty strong. While we're on the topic of Land Rovers, let's chat about the early 2000s Range Rovers. You could get them with two engine flavors, the BMW M62 engine or the Jaguar AJ Series V8. You know which one suffers catastrophic failures? Yeah, the BMW M62, believe it or not. The Jag motor is actually one of the best sounding V8s out there, period. So there's really no comparison. Oh, and also, quick tip, stay away from the 2010 plus five liter motors. Unless you know that the timing chains and front crossover coolant pipes have already been done, and the rear crossover pipe, and the plastic pipe from the oil cooler to the water pump, and the water pump it, itself, which you can plan to replace every 20,000 miles or so, the 5.0 leaks out of everything when they overheat. Which brings us to probably the worst car ever made, 
Luckily, they only built one of them. I mean, just look at this thing. It looks like an absolute death trap. So why do I want one? I mean, it looks like it's gonna roll over just standing still. It has hand beaten aluminum body and almost enough wheels. But I think the worst part is that the two stroke motor requires the driver to feed it oil continuously. It's like the BMW Izetta's ugly cousin. <laughs> the Hoffman had a two stroke, but this next car blew oil smoke like a poorly tuned weed whacker. It's the infamous pre-2014 BMW 7 Series. This one's easy. The V8s had valve stem seals that had more fails than the worst student in gym class. And that's an epic fail. But this failure caused major oil burning issues, leaving a massive plume of blue smoke as you took off from every stoplight. And here, you only thought Subarus did that. <laughs> ah, nah. Plus, you had timing chain problems, chains that cost more to replace than putting a kid through college. It's a BMW that you just don't want to touch just like a porcupine, which really the only difference between the two with the BMW is that the prick is in the inside. <laughs> this next BMW is a joke too. The late 2000s Mini Coopers. Okay, this really mostly pertains to the S model, which I think stands for stay away. It's got this Tri-Tech engine that was co-developed between BMW and Chrysler, which is just straight gross. I mean, when Chrysler worked with Lambo for the V10 and the Viper, that was cool. And when BMW worked with McLaren to supply the engine in the McLaren F1, that was really cool too. But I never wanted to see BMW and Chrysler hook up. Guess what? They did. And the four banger built by Tritech was their engineering catastrophe. Don't even get me started on the issues that these little motors have. Just, I don't, hate them, but you want to know what you're getting into before you buy one. I guess that's just what I'm saying. Minis are such a fun little front wheel drive car, which front wheel drive is pretty much the only thing in common with this next car, the Chrysler Sebring. I swear Chrysler paid the office TV show for product placement. I mean, how did the nerdy Michael Scott own the Sebring, but he also owned another Chrysler product that's on this list, the PT Cruiser convertible. Yeah, both of them are convertibles, they're uglier than Trav's ex-girlfriend. The Sebring is not very reliable or fun. And when the worn soft top starts leaking, it's like 3K to fix. I don't think you could really pick a worse car. I mean, at least go with something reliable. Maybe you're saying, yeah, but I want a convertible and I want it to be reliable. Well, we all know there's one brand known for reliability. If you want a convertible Toyota, get a Solara. But if you want to get an executive car, don't get a Volvo S80 T6. This was the flagship of the Volvo fleet. You've probably seen one on the road, but that's a pretty rare sighting because these things live in the repair shop. The Scandinavian design body is very easy on the eyes. I got to agree. Man, that twin turbo 2.9 liter has a bunch of issues. Head gaskets pop and transmissions are guaranteed to die on these things. The tranny is a 4T65 General Motors transaxle. And it's just too light of a trans for the amount of torque these cars make when they're running. The T6s are Volvo's problem child, just like this Italian problem child, the Maserati Quattroporte. No Maserati is a standout in their segment. Wait, they all are standouts, but in a bad way. Yes, the Quattroporte is nicer than a Camry, but I know which one I'd choose if I wanted to make it to my destination on a first date. And these things cost a fortune to keep on the road. Heck, even base model QPs have these huge six piston front brake calipers, which means they're a huge expense to replace. Think of it as the closest thing you can get to a four door Ferrari sedan. And although you can get them for as cheap as 13K, ooh, I want one. Stop that, stop that, stop that. Brad, you know better. But yes, they do sound very good. <laughs> Remember, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Just like this German tuner car, the Audi B5 S4. Yes, 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 come here. I will admit it, I like the B5 S4. And I almost bought Travs from him, which uh, should have told me something because he's an Audi master technician and he was selling his B5 S4. It was pretty much because he was tired working on it. It's a Volkswagen Group twin turbo V6 
built in the late 90s. You know, when Audis weren't reliable. Wait, aren't they still not reliable today? <laughs> anyway, well, their turbo fours were a pain in the ass. And now multiply that by 50% more engine? Uh, yeah, I'm no math major, but it's got some super brittle plastics everywhere. During some of the scheduled regular maintenance, the whole front end of the car has to come off. And if it needs actual repairs, it's not uncommon to have to remove the engine entirely. And from one German automaker to another, you have the BMW X5. And I don't think I've ever heard the term V8 X5 and most reliable used in the same sentence together. I mean, every BMW has subpar cooling systems, like every Volkswagen has electrical issues, and Mercedes just has, well, problems. Although they look great and drive excellent, the N62 V8 engine has some pretty expensive problems, especially if you're gonna take it on a journey, which is an insult to compare a BMW to uh, our next car. But here we are. Dodge Journey, the home of the subprime loan literally it's dodge's will finance pretty much anyone's car go to any dollar general and you'll see a ton of them there trav likes most dodge stuff but he hates the journey plus i'm pretty sure it was the last vehicle on earth to be offered with a four speed automatic but we don't all hate the journey as much as we hate the caliber ladies and gentlemen the worst car i've ever driven the dodge avenger <laughs> <laughs> Lemon Law attorneys have made an absolute killing on Ford Fiestas and Focuses. Fiesta means pate in Spanish, but the transmission scandal from the early to mid 2010s Fiestas and Focuses, Focus I? is a party Ford didn't want to be a part of. It's all because of the DPS6 transmission. And yes, it did have a very cool name, the Power shift transmission. Do you want to feel so energetic? Try Power Thirst. Energy drinks for people who need gratuitous amounts of energy. But it used this dry clutch technology, which let me let you in on a little secret. You want it to be wet. And all that friction would heat it up and it would fail. It's really a bummer because otherwise they're solid cars. Luckily, the top tier versions, you know, the Focus RSs, which are the son of the rally car, and the little Fiesta ST packs a huge punch. Just say no to the base models. Okay, question. Does anyone remember the show Survivor? Well, back in 2000, this dude Richard Hatch won a Pontiac Aztec. And not only did Dick Hatch win the ugliest car ever made, but he also won a million dollars. Now. This guy is the typical Aztec owner. He publicly brags about how he did not pay taxes on not only the million dollars, but also the Aztec that he won as well. Well, guess what? All that bragging got him 51 months in prison. Aztec owners, they like to brag, but no one listens to them because it's so bad on the eyes. <laughs> the Fix It Again Tony special is a quirky little bugger. And the Abarth version, straight piped, sounds amazing. The Fiats have continually ranked the lowest in quality ratings, and the 500 has a horrible automatic transmission and a buggy infotainment system. But Italian cars are not known for build quality, reliability, resale value, or really anything except it's just their culture. But the Yugo, it is one man's fault. This entrepreneur, Malcolm Bricklin, was in a situation. He had 120 days to find a profitable car to sell in the USA, or he'd go bankrupt. What he did is import the worst car ever made. The Yugo was a horrible design, about as safe as a go-kart without wearing your helmet, and as reliable as your friend that never shows up for a meatloaf dinner. And somehow, some way, it picked up a cult following. Some things just don't make sense, just like the PT Cruiser GT. Okay, this is the best version of one of the worst cars ever made. This is a bold statement, but the PT Cruiser is the worst Chrysler that you should never buy. Chrysler has made some pretty dodgy products. On paper, the PT Cruiser, well, it is pretty cool. I mean, it's got retro styling and a little turbine drumming up 14 pounds of boost, so you're gifted 215 horsepower. But the fun, <laughs> It ends there. It was an attempt at a retro throwback design, 
but it definitely missed the retro mark, just like the Jaguar X-Type. Okay, now I'll admit it, these are kind of cool looking in their own baby XJ way. After all, it's just a Ford Mondeo underneath. And the chassis was shared with the Land Rover Freelander, which made it on this list. It's pretty easy to see why this Jaguar made the list. Now, let me sum up this next car in one sentence. It's the Nissan Versa. It's depression in mechanical form. What else do I have to say? Well, the Dodge Charger with the 2.7 V6 would like to have a word. This thing is the sludge sickle. Well, it's the sludge machine. The engine is not only underpowered, but it literally generates toxic sludge, which causes these engines to fail. And if that doesn't get it, the weak antiquated four-speed auto will. It's not fully charged, although it is a charger, and not worth your hard-earned cash. If there was one car on this list that I'd be tempted to buy even after being on this ideal list, it would be the Volkswagen Phaeton W12. The W12 is probably the most impressive feature on an insanely impressive car. The Phaeton is the brainchild of the one and only Fernandad Peach, the chairman of the Volkswagen Group through most of the last few decades. He wanted to build a car that would one-up the best BMW 7 Series and Mercedes S-Class. To me, it's weird that he chose to do it with Volkswagen and not Audi. I mean, the Phaeton does just kind of look like a bigger Passat. This was around the same time the Bugatti Veyron with the W16 was dreamt up. I have to get Trav to do a launch control on the W-shaped motors because it doesn't make much sense to me. But as you can tell, the Volkswagen Group at the time was straight bonkers. And as we all know, there's nothing more expensive than a cheap luxury car. This is the car that makes you a millionaire if you bought it when you were a billionaire. <laughs> in all seriousness though, it's cool, quirky, and it's got the same engine that you get in most Bentleys. Trouble is, it's Bentley money to maintain, and at the end of the day, Bentley money with a Volkswagen badge, yeah. <laughs> oh, you smell that? It's time for the honorable mention, baby. Yeah! And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about lightly used Toyota Tacomas and Subaru WRXs and STIs. Now, if you're in the market for any lightly used vehicle that holds value super well, do yourself a favor and go to a dealer and see what type of deal you can get on a new one. Yes, you may be surprised. Brand new Tacomas and WRXs and STIs usually cost almost the same as they do a year or two old. Plus you get the benefit of a full warranty, no miles, and new cars have better financing rates. Because yeah, that one year old STI that's for sale with the huge intercooler, hella horns, and racing slicks that the owner swears has never seen track time, probably has. And so by buying new, you never have to worry about how much abuse it's already taken. Cause guess what? I hate unknowns. And this next car, you probably, well, it was unknown to you. It's the Cadillac ELR. I don't even wanna to pretend to know that ELR stands for Electric Luxury Roadster or lie and say that it was a great value because, well, at 60,000 bucks, this thing was pretty much a $60,000 Chevy Volt. And the Volt is a better car in every way. It's got better range, better features, and yes, the Caddy, I think it does look pretty cool. It's kind of like a less edgy CTSV. But the electric range was laughable, especially when you compare it to Tesla Model S's that were launched around the same time. It was a sales failure because it was expensive, cramped, faux luxury that consumers could see straight through. So what's the idealist car on this list? Well, I think you probably already know. It's the Phaeton, if I had to pick one. Do you have any other cars to add to this list? Let's all get smarter together. So let us know in the comments below, hit that subscribe button, turn on that notification bell, I'm Brad Danger, this is Ideal. If you wanna help support the channel, go snag some swag, links down in the description, and go check out this Ideal Starter Pack up here, or check out what YouTube recommends you watch next. Oh, and uh, promise me one thing, keep living the Ideal lifestyle. Mm -hmm.